Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bosch. The number of clean diesel models in North America will double by 2014. Bosch Clean Diesel. Good. Clean. Fun. Bridgestone. Your journey. Our passion. And by Dow Automotive Systems. Improving durability and increasing design flexibility with Betamate structural adhesives at DowBetamate.com. Welcome to AutoLine Daily for March 22nd. I'm John McElroy, and here's what's going on in the world of the automobile. Gasoline prices have shot up around the world, but they'd have to go up even more to make it worthwhile to buy an electric vehicle. According to the Lundberg survey, gas prices would have to jump to over $8.50 a gallon in order for a Nissan Leaf to be competitive against a gasoline-powered car, and for the Chevy Volt, the price would have to be $12.50 a gallon. The numbers are based on the cost of gasoline versus electricity and their fuel efficiency and the depreciation of those cars. So you can stick a fork in the EV revolution if that's what it's take, going to take for them to catch on. And of course, we're talking here about U.S. gasoline prices. In Europe, they're already at the $8 a gallon level, but EVs are not selling very well there, even at that price. GM says it will continue building cars down under for at least another decade. The Australian government just promised close to $290 million in assistance to keep Holden manufacturing in the country. Holden will also invest more than a billion dollars to produce two new models. Man. Just when I think I have some sort of rudimentary understanding of trademark law, turns out I don't know nothing. Get this, Suzuki sells a version of the Swift in Europe called the GTI. That's with a lower case I. Well, that really ticked off Volkswagen, which, as you know, has a version of the Golf called the GTI that's known around the world and has been for decades. But the European U Union's general court just ruled that Suzuki's use of the name GTI will not create any confusion with VW's use of the name GTI. As we've been reporting here, there's a lot of bad blood between Suzuki and VW, which owns nearly 20% of the Japanese car maker, and this is only going to add fuel to the fire. Okay, we just couldn't resist reporting on this one. BM is a specialty car maker in Italy that modifies vehicles for very specific uses, including hearses. And they just came out with this Rolls-Royce Phantom hearse, what they call the B12. They claim it's the only Rolls-Royce hearse that you can buy in the world. It's powered by the standard 6.7 liter V12, and the rear of the car is made of aluminum. And you know, when I first saw this car, I thought it looked goofy, but the more I look at it, you can tell this thing's extremely well made. Those guys are craftsmen. Toyota's getting back into the sports car market with the Scion FRS. Co-developed with Subaru, this spunky little coupe has been getting lots of attention from enthusiasts. It's powered by a two-liter boxer engine that whips up an even 200 horsepower. By today's standards, that might sound a little weak, but this car's not about brute force. Finesse is the name of the game. Rear wheel drive should help it handle better than similarly priced small cars like the Honda Civic Si. Speaking of money, Scion just released a few numbers. The base price of the FRS is $24,200. That'll get you a car with a six-speed manual transmission and if you need an automatic, it'll cost you another 1100 bucks and the EPA fuel economy numbers for the FRS and its Subaru doppelganger, the BRZ, just came out. If you were hoping for an efficiency knockout, you might be disappointed. Cars equipped with a manual transmission will deliver only 22 miles per gallon around town and 30 on the highway. That averages out to 25 mpg, which is roughly 9.4 liters per 100 kilometers. If you sell out, I mean, if you opt for the automatic gearbox, the numbers go up considerably, hitting 25 and 34 with a combined score of 28 miles per gallon, which is about 8.4 liters per 100 clicks. That's enough to beat the Mazda MX-5 in economy. But you know, it's kind of disappointing when you consider that the bigger, more powerful V6 Mustang 
can get up to 31 MPGs. Do you notice something missing on this grill right here? Well, I'll tell you what it is right after the break. Look at this. Bridgestone's using natural rubber, researching ways to enhance its quality and performance, and making their factories more environmentally friendly, producing products that save on fuel and emissions, and some that can be reused again, and promoting eco-friendly and safety driving campaigns. One team, one planet. Bridgestone. Ever since it was introduced a few years ago, the Ford Flex has been somewhat of a sales disappointment. But the company is no doubt hoping to turn things around with this, the redesigned 2013 model. Well, first and foremost, you can see from the front end, we took the Ford Oval off of the front end for the Flex and put the Flex naming right on the hood. Uh, it's a little bit more sophisticated design. And if you look at the front end, it's a little more contoured than the outgoing uh, Flex. On the rear, we've added a, a new Flex applique and we have new wheels uh, for all the, v, all the flex trim levels. On the interior, we've added my Ford Touch. We've added a number of new features to the vehicle. Uh, we've added uh, adaptive steering column, uh, power side mirrors. Uh, we also have uh, rear inflatable belts, which was a segment exclusive uh, from the Explorer, and we moved it over to the Flex as well. Um, we've added a number of NVH improvement actions for improved quietness in the interior. Uh, we've also gone E-Pass, uh, electronic power, uh, assisted steering across all the flex applications. Before it was only on the EcoBoost, now you can get it on the TIVCT. We've also improved the fuel economy. So on the city and the highway, we've improved the fuel economy by one mile per gallon and added horsepower by 25 horsepower for the outgoing vehicle. So we've done a lot underneath the hood, underneath the vehicle, inside, and then on the exterior, you can see the beautiful exterior. But Ford didn't stop with the vehicle itself. It's also upgrading the Flex's marketing message to drive more people to showrooms to help improve sales of this stylish crossover. Well, we start with our own owners that are really passionate about Flex and, and work socially with those. So via Facebook, spreading the news about the new Flex, and then also um, you know, working online and creating some online things that people can share. And, and say what's new about the Flex. I mean, people that own one love them and are very passionate about it and loyal back to the brand. So that's one of the things we're doing from a national point of view. And locally, with 20% of the sales coming from California, work with the local markets and dealer groups on you know, targeting Flex in those markets that are early adopters. And certainly California is one of them. The style resonates in Southern California where, where style conscious vehicles are very important and use that as some traction to continue across the country. The Ford Flex has always been a terrific crossover vehicle, especially if you're hitting the road and driving out to a beautiful place like Oregon's rocky coastline. And the changes Ford has made for 2013 only make it better. But will more people buy them? That is the $47,000 question because that is what our limited all-wheel drive model here costs, and that's without EcoBoost. If you want that engine upgrade, it's gonna cost you even more. Reporting from Northern Oregon for AutoLine Daily, I'm Craig Cole. How interesting that they took the blue Ford Oval off the front of the car. Clearly the people who buy these things don't want the world to know they're driving around in a Ford. And did you notice that putting the letters F-L-E-X on the leading edge of the hood makes it look more like a Land Rover? I'm sure Ford got the idea for that when it still owned Land Rover. And that shot of me with the inflatable seat belt? That was just a demo. Obviously in the real world that belt would pop open instantly, not in slow-mo like you just saw. And yikes, a fully loaded one goes for nearly 50 grand? No wonder they want to keep on building these things, even though sales are slow. Hey, don't forget to join me tonight for AutoLine After Hours when we'll have Pietro Gorlier from Mopar on the show. We'll also have the Mopar 12 in the studio and if you haven't seen what Pietro's doing with this brand, you'll definitely want to tune in because Mopar is on the move. That's tonight, live at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can always get the podcast tomorrow at the iTunes Store. Just look for AutoLine. And that wraps up today's show. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>